We're here to observe our minds, but we start by observing the breath. It's because the breath is like an object we're working on. And you see the results of your actions in the object. And that way you get more sensitive to what you're doing. Say, for instance, you see a basket. It looks pretty easy. Shouldn't be any problem making one. And so you make one. And then you look at your basket and you look at a nice basket and you say they're two very different things. Now, some people give up at that point. Other people say, well, there must be something I'm doing wrong. So they go back and look at what they're doing, make another basket. Then look at that one, but there, what in that basket still needs to be improved. The object itself is not all that different, but it's what you've done with it that makes all the difference. And you see your actions in the object. When you say that they're not giving good results, we have to go back and change. And this way you get more sensitive to what you're doing. And that's the whole purpose of the concentration, is to get more sensitive to what the mind is doing. This, of course, relates to the heart of the teaching, which are the Four Noble Truths. We're doing something in the mind that's giving rise to suffering. But we also have the potential to do something that puts an end to suffering, and to see the difference. You have to focus on what you're doing. You have to learn how to see what you're doing in the results, and see the connection between cause and effect, and see the difference between cause and effect. And that requires some very sharp powers of observation, which is another reason why we want to observe the mind in concentration, because the concentration allows us to see subtle things we couldn't see otherwise. So you focus on the breath and you begin to realize that the way you focus on the breath, the image you hold in mind of the breath, the perception of the breath, is going to have an effect on how the breath feels, whether it's going to be a good place to stay or not a good place to stay. But those are things you can change. If it's not good, try something else. If that's not good, try something else. And when it is good, learn how to stay with it. Observe what you've got. It's all too tempting when you read about the different levels of jhana to say, well, just let's race through them. But you don't see anything by racing through them. We're not here to notch little notches in our belt. We're here to observe the mind. And so one way of observing the mind is to get the mind in a good state of concentration, and the next step is to keep it there until you really get to know it. And try to see what problems you have in keeping it there. One very common one is that you slip off the breath and go into the sense of ease, and things get muddy, blurry. It's like you go into a dream world, what a John Lee calls delusion concentration, where things are very still, but you're not very clear about where you are. That's not the kind of concentration that's going to give any insight into your actions. So you have to realize there's a distinction between the breath and the pleasure. They're going to both be there in almost the same place, but there are different things. The pleasure is the result. The shape of the breath, the way you're breathing, that has to do with your actions and intentions. So you maintain that intention to stay with the breath. You learn to see that even though these things come together, they are different. You learn how to be precise in your observation. 
And in doing so, the mind gets into stronger concentration and allows you to see things even more precisely. You begin to see that the discussion you have about staying with the breath, adjusting the breath, becomes a disturbance. And when you really clearly see that it is a disturbance, that's when you let it go. You don't let it go beforehand. In other words, it's not simply because you're told that if you want to get farther along in the concentration, that's what you've got to do. You've got to really see for yourself that it is disturbing what you've got. This is one of the reasons why when John Fuang was teaching meditation, one, he wouldn't talk about John at all. And two, if anyone asked him about what's the next step or the next step, he says, don't wait, worry about that yet. Worry about where you are right now. If it's something good, keep it up. And whether it's John or not John, as long as it feels good, stick with it. And when you see something disturbing, drop that if you can still stay in the concentration. Now sometimes something seems like a disturbance, but if you drop it, you've lost your concentration, which is a sign you're not ready to drop it yet. Go back, pick it up. In other words, don't let your concentration be too much ruled by the text, too much ruled by what you've heard about concentration. And focus really on what you're doing right now. And see what's a cause and what's a result. When they separate out clearly, then you can move on. Drop anything that's getting in the way, getting the mind to really settle down and be at its ease, and hold on to whatever you need. And John Swat gave a Dharma talk one time talking about how anything that comes to disturb your concentration you regard as stress as suffering, even though it may not seem all that onerous or all that heavy. That's how the perfection of concentration leads to discernment, moves it into the Four Noble Truths. But you don't have to think about Four Noble Truths. Just think about what is this disturbance right here. Try to be very precise in how you observe things. We had that question this afternoon about how the big problem is the ego. Well, ego means a lot of things, and it involves a lot of different actions, some of which are actually skillful and some of which are not. It's too big a concept to, to function as the analysis is going to succeed in getting rid of a problem. You have to see the problem in action. In other words, you have to see what you're doing in action, because that's the problem. There may be ignorance there. There may be craving there. And you want to be very precise about how these things arise, how they pass away. Because it's only when you see it arise that you begin to say, well, this is the allure. This is why I go for them. And it may be something you hadn't expected at all. There may be something hiding behind what you think is a perfectly fine idea a perfectly justified idea. When you ask yourself, well, why go for that? It's one of the reasons why when we're getting the mind concentrated, everything that gets in the way, no matter how right your ideas may be or how good your ideas may be, has to be regarded as a disturbance, as a distraction. You develop a certain amount of skepticism toward your ideas. So when the mind feels tempted to go for them, you can begin to ask, well, why? And the voice that says, well, of course, this is good, this is right. You learn not to trust that voice. It says, maybe there's something else going on as well. The more precise you are in seeing things, the more clearly you see where the allure is. And then you can compare it with the drawbacks. If you go for that thought, what are the drawbacks? And when you can see these things clearly, that's when it begins to hit home. Yes, this is something you really do want to get, get past, something you really do want to escape from.
So even though there is this tendency to reduce the Buddha's teachings to a few slogans or a few general concepts. Still, as practitioners, we have to resist that, because we're looking for the particulars. Why this disturbance? Why this distraction? Why do you go for it? Well, how did it start? Where does it start? And does it really last, or does it come and go? When it goes, why does it go? What's the difference? between the mind state when it picks it up and the mind state when it drops it. What happened to the allure? Sometimes the allure comes when you pick it up, but then it fades very quickly. You drop it. But then you forget and you pick it up again. Why did it fade? You want to slice things very finely this way. And your ability to slice things finely that way has to come from your practice of concentration. Where you can see things distinctly, like this is the breath, this is the ease that comes from the breath. They're two separate things, even though they're right there together. So there's a lot of discernment that has to be developed in the course of getting the mind into concentration and maintaining the concentration, and particularly insight into what you're doing. The breath becomes the object that you shape with your actions. And you look at the shape of the breath, and you learn a lot about your actions. You can start discerning where your lack of skill is, and you can do something about it, which is much better than dealing in abstractions or imposing ideas you picked up from books, even from the teachings of the Ajans. The words may be right, but sometimes the way you understand them is not quite right. And how do you make it right? Well, you look carefully at what you're doing. Be precise in your observation of what you're doing. Be precise in the observation of the object you've made here with a breath, the concentration you've made by staying with a breath. And that's how you begin to arrive at some insights that really do make a difference in the mind. They show you something that's been here all along, but you haven't seen it, because you haven't been looking in the right place, or haven't been looking precisely enough, or haven't been asking the right questions. But it's here to be seen. So the more precise you are in chasing away distractions, the quicker you are in chasing away distractions. And the more precise you are in how you focus on things and the perceptions you use, the more the practice of concentration really will be good for the mind. Because it'll show you areas where you've been foolish, areas where you've been blind, things we normally don't like to see, but the things we have to learn how to see if we want to stop suffering.